Hello everybody, Raven Knight here. Year 8, Season 2 is upon us, the Muramasa Blade, and with the new season comes a brand new hero skin, Master Katashi. The totally awesome Orochi skin that everyone's been super excited for, and I've really been enjoying the character and the design and getting to play with him, although I do think I'm a little cursed. Every time I play him, I end up in a really rough match, but that's beside the point. I recently read his lore to you guys. If you haven't seen it yet, go check out this video called The Master, where I read to you guys his lore that Ubisoft provides for us and honestly I'll tell you guys up front now it's pretty good I actually do like this lore again go give it a listen if you haven't already um, it's a great read so I think you guys will like it but as always guys today we're gonna talk about that lore I'm gonna tell you guys what I think about it as a writer and I'll tell you guys what I think is good what I think is bad what I think could be worked on and what we can take away from it so without further ado let's dive into the lore so first of all I want to say that this lore is very much by the books. It's it's a lore that you kind of expect from a samurai uh, Kurosawa kind of movie or story, something like that. The, the tropes are all there. You have this village in danger and jeopardy being overrun by these bandits or these villains or these vagrants. And then you have the innocent old man or mother being about to be executed. The child desperately trying to save them. But then along at the last moment comes this wandering hero with no name who appears in the village as if out of nowhere. They seem rough around the edges or seem mysterious. But then they draw their sword or their gun or whatever they have. And they end up killing all the bandits and then facing off against the bandit leader in one final fight. And they inspire everyone just from their actions. But then once they kill the enemy and they save the day, they don't stick around for the festivities. They turn on their heels and say, see you around, kid. And then head off to that next fight in the sunset. It's exactly what you'd expect. It's the kind of thing you see in old country westerns like with Clint Eastwood or in Kurosawa Ronin style films or in, you know, like we, or even in night stories like you'll have the wandering knight who does this. You get these kind of stories all the time. You're very, we're very used to these kind of stories and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. As a matter of fact, I'm a sucker for those kind of stories, okay? I love those kind of tales about the wandering hero who doesn't ask for any reward or for any thanks. He just goes where he needs, goes where the people need him and saves the day. You know, a hero of the people for the people. You know, I, I love those kind of stories. So I was very much in love with this kind of tale and he very does much meet what I would expect. Now we don't hear a whole lot about his origin, but that's okay. You don't necessarily need a big origin. Sometimes leaving it vague is helpful. Like I really like the fact that when he says, I'm always wandering, never a settler, that kind of thing. It said that there was kind of a sadness there. And it makes you wonder, why is he wandering? Like, did he have a master that he abandoned? Or that he failed? Or did he get dismissed from service? Like, who is this guy? You kind of want to know more about him. And I like the fact that they left some of it vague. Kind of like what they did with the Unsung Knight. In fact, we'll be talking a lot about the Unsung Knight here in just a minute. But that's beside the point. What I think is really neat about this is it leaves enough um, mysterious to, cra to make you crave more but doesn't leave so much vague that you can't draw a lot of conclusions from it. I really like the fact that he just really does embody this Clint Eastwood or Kurosawa style kind of character. I think it just fits really well. Now, we have this setup where we have this village, uh, the village of Kuri, if I remember it right, um, where you have this bandit lord named Boss Man Boon, uh, Boonzo. I almost said Boontaro. I've been, well, I've been reading Shogun again. <laughs> anyway, Boss Man Boonzo running the show here and at first i was a little iffy about boonzo because it said that he was rounding up people to kill and i'm kind of like well hold on boonzo if you're a if you want money from this place why are you killing people you like it's this idea of killing people may be entertaining for you but you're not going to get any money out of it you gotta you gotta get them to give you money right so why kill them but then i remembered he has the muramasa blade and according to the legend that they mention, wielding the Moramasa blade gives you the strength of an army, but it makes you incredibly bloodthirsty. So it could be that the sword is making him crave blood, and the story does indicate that, so I think that's where they were going, which is pretty clever. But that will lead to a problem later, which we will get to. So he's about to execute this old man when the teenage son of the old man runs out and says, no, no, spare him, spare him. And Boons was like, ha ha, you little loser, get out of my way, I'm going to kill him anyway. And then that's when our hero comes in to save the day. Uh, and Katashi walks in. Very much I usually expect walking in playing his flute. Not the most practical thing to do, but still kind of badass. Walks in, basically slays all the henchmen without a problem. Then fights Boonzo. Boonzo actually gets a lick in. He actually manages to hit uh, uh, Katashi. And Katashi hits the ground. 
But we don't get a, we don't get an indication that he's losing. We don't get an indication that Katashi is shaken or upset or scared. More of, oh, okay, that was unexpected. And he's about to get up when suddenly in comes a teenage kid again who's ready like, no, don't hurt him. Now, here's the thing. Having a little kid like this in your story isn't a bad thing. Like, you can have it be where the kid wants to stick up for Katashi. And what I like about it is they established that he had a hopeful expression. Like, he had a hope in his voice. And I think that's what Katashi appreciated. Not the fact that he ran in to save him. The fact that the boy was inspired. He had gained hope through what Katashi had done. So Katashi shoves the boy out of the way and then kills Bunzo. Pretty cool stuff. And then right after that, the old man is, like, thanking him so much. Oh, thank you so much. You saved our life. But then... Um, Katashi says, I should be thanking your son. And at first, I didn't like that. I was like, the boy didn't really do anything. It's not like Katashi was in any real danger. Like, what did the boy even do other than just get in the way for a minute? But then I thought about it. I think he was grateful to the boy for reminding him that he could bring hope to the hopeless. You know, that this boy who was so afraid and uh, so prepared to die at the hands of Bunzo suddenly gained hope and was actually willing to stand up to the oppressor. But the only problem with that is he was already trying to stand up to him earlier when the uh, monster was trying to kill his father. So, you know, tit for tat. But whatever the case. So he then gives the sword to the kid, saying, you can protect your village better with this. But while he's doing this, he's looking around at the village and all the destruction. And Katashi says, this is wrong. Even though I technically saved this place, is this really saving it? Did I really do anything meaningful here? Because I don't feel like I did. If I had been quicker, if I'd been better, I could have prevented this. So he decides it's time for me to stop wandering. It's time for me to it's time for me to stop going from town to town. It's time for me to actually take responsibility and do something. So he takes up the Muramasa blade that had been dropped by Bunzo, and then the kid and then the old man asks, Where are you going? And Clint Eastwood style, where I need it. You know, like <laughs> like I, God, he reminds me so much of Clint Eastwood. <laughs> anyway, I'm a big fan of those old westerns, okay? Screw me. But anyway, uh, back, to the, back to the issue at hand. Here's where I see a problem. This is where I see two problems. The first one's kind of a silly one, but it's, it is a problem. Why did he go for... Because here, here was what I thought. I thought that Katashi, what he was doing, was protecting the Meyer from internal threats. Like, keep in mind, when he beats Boon, uh, when he beats Boonzo, he's not fighting Vikings or Knights or Wulin. He's fighting other samurai, other Meyer individuals. I thought his whole thing was he was protecting the Meyer from itself, like protecting it from the vagrants and the vagabonds and the Ronin. He was actually protecting the people from their own worse individuals, which would be a very creative step. But now he's going off to a bridge called Psycho Bridge to protect it from everyone, like regardless of faction. And I'm like, wait, so you were protecting the people from their own problems, from bandits and Ronin and the like. Now you're going off to protect it from other factions. Not that that's a problem, but it seems like a weird jump to make. It's almost like, <laughs> it's almost like Batman said, my family was killed by muggers. I shall now protect the world from Martians. <laughs> You know, it's kind of like, like I thought that your, I thought that your motivation was very different there, but that's beside the point. And I have a theory as to why that is, but I just think that's funny. But the second problem we have, and this is the real problem, the real problem with the lore. And it, it, hey, you know what? If this is the only problem with the lore we have, you're doing pretty good. But it is a problem. This whole season, in fact, this whole year, to be honest, is about weapons. Like they've said that this is a year about weapons. Like last season. The, the Ashfeld sword, the sword of Ashfeld, this legendary sword passed from warden to warden, which is said to unite all of Ashfeld in times of need, that it will be held in the hands of a hero. And sure enough, we see that happen in the story of the unsung knight who shows up to defend Ashfeld from the other factions when they show up and unite the divided, the divided allegions of Ashfeld once more, we see the sword has real merit in her story. That's why she doesn't have a name. The unsung knight isn't what's important. It's her deeds that are done with the sword. I know that I said in her video I wish she'd been named, but now that I've thought about it for a while, I think it's best that she not be named. I think that, that was a good thing that they did that. I, I mean, of course, she's still Ruth, let's be honest. It's unsung Ruth. Hashtag unsung Ruth. But here, though... The Muramasa Blade is only talked about in passing. Its curse is only mentioned in passing. And I think that's a great disservice because I think that maybe that should have played a larger role. I wanted Katashi to pick up the sword and have a reaction. You know? I wanted him to pick up the sword and the moment he touched it, like he senses something. 
he feels the anger of the sword. He feels the rage of the sword. He feels the curse underneath it. And he may even let go of it for a moment, realizing what he's just touched. And then that's what makes him realize this sword, if I leave it alone, is going to cause more problems. Someone else is going to pick it up. Someone else is going to use it. And it's just going to lead to more and more. Therefore, I must carry it. I will master this sword. I will take care of this sword. And just to make sure that I am even further protecting the people of the mire, just to make sure that the mire is even further protected, I'm going to go to Seiko Bridge at the border of the mire and protect it from other factions. That way, if I ever do lose myself to the curse, if I ever do give in to the bloodlust of this blade, it will not be the people of the mire who I hurt, but it will be enemies of the mire that I hurt. And I think that would have been a much stronger way to, to apply the blade to him. This master of peace and serenity who's been working to overcome the demons of his past now picks up an actual demonic sword and says, I will conquer this the same way I've conquered my past. That would be a, and it would also be a way for him to atone, basically saying, I don't deserve to be a wandering hero to the people when I'm guilty of all these crimes of my past. Therefore, I will pick up the sword and atone for my past mistakes through the use of the sword, and I will face off against the enemies of the mire, and they will taste the rage of this blade through my skill. I think that would have been an excellent way to do it, but they didn't. Now, you could argue, well, Raven, you know, it was vague enough to imply that, and Yes, you could draw that conclusion, but they don't make a big deal. I think it would have been a lot better if they had implied it. Like, have him pick up the sword and have him react to it. Or maybe have him pick up the sword and after he picks it up, that's when he decides to go to Seiko. But no, he was already deciding he was done wandering before he even picked up the sword. So the implication was what made him change his mind about wandering was not the sword, it was the boy. Which is fine, that's not a bad thing, like you can have it that way, but then it makes the sword feel less of an impact. Like, let me put it this way, if we didn't already know that the Muramasa sword was a legendary cursed sword, based on the story alone, do you think it would even matter that he picked it up? Do you think it would have been all that relevant? Because... But keep in mind, we only know that the Muramasa sword is cursed because they vaguely kind of reference it in this lore very briefly, but then we don't know why he would pick it up in the first place. Like, they reference, oh, it gives you the strength of an army, but it makes you bloodthirsty. But then there's no fear. Like, th here's the thing. Think about it. Like, let me give you an example. Let's say that, oh, keep in mind, the villagers had heard the rumors about the sword. They'd heard about how dangerous it was, how deadly it was, how awful it was. Now Boonzo's defeated, and then they see their hero pick it up. Don't you think one of them might say, Don't pick that up, my lord, it's cursed! Or, Sir, that sword is dangerous, you should leave it where it is! Or, Sir, that sword has to be destroyed! You know, have someone react and remind us, Hey, Katashi, that sword's bad news! But we never see that. We never have that happen. He just picks it up, and, they, and he goes about his business like it's nothing. I would like it to be implied that by picking up the sword, Katashi is swearing to something or dealing with something or, you know, he like some kind of reaction is given to him picking up this cursed sword because remember, the name of the season is the Muramasa Blade and I'd like that blade to take front and center stage. What does the blade do to Katashi? How does he react to it? How does he master it? How does a man, a single man, overcome a curse that is maybe hundreds of years in the making? Like, how does he do it? What steps does he take? Does he meditate daily? Does he wrestle with himself? Is it like a bleach thing where he has to train with the spirit of the blade itself? You know, that show is... But whatever. Point is, what does he do? I want to know the story about Katashi and this sword. Not just how he gets the sword, how he deals with the sword. Otherwise, it's just, okay, well, he picked up a sword. It's a cool sword. It's got a neat history, but what what does he do with it? Like, like it, it's one of those things where I'd like to see what is done with it. You know, wh where will we go with it next? That's what I would have liked to have seen. But if I'm being honest, that's not a huge deal. It's just something I would have liked to have seen and explored more. But overall, for what we got, it's not bad. It's a good short story within the Myers history itself. It keeps things very condensed. It doesn't involve Chimera or Horkos. And honestly, I'll be real, it feels timeless. I had a time trying to figure out when this story takes place. Does it take place during, before the Cataclysm? After the Cataclysm? During the time of Horkos? Or Chimera? Or Apollyon? When does the story take place? And you can't really tell. The story doesn't give a whole lot of indication. I mean, judging from the armor, we can assume it's well past Cataclysm. But what else? We don't hear about Horkos or Chimera or anything. So, for all we know, we don't know when the story takes place. It could
could be a folklore tale for all we know, but you know what? That makes it more timeless. That means that it can carry just about anywhere, and honestly, I like that. I think that's good. I actually like that a bit more within the Unsung Knight because hers was very clear. She was just the knight who showed up in that trailer to fight off the other factions, but I think it's kind of funny because we don't really know how that ended, and here we know how this ended, but again, whatever. But overall, I think it was done very well. I think that this is very, very cool. This is a very cool and well-designed story. I think it was handled well. I think it was paced pretty well. The only problem I have is I feel like it should have tied in the blade and its curse with uh, Katashi a lot better than it did. I feel like it could have done that a lot better. But if that's the only problem I have with it, this didn't do too bad, guys. I thought that was pretty good. So I hope you guys enjoyed. Again, if you haven't heard the story yet, go listen to the video. Um, I recorded it not too long ago, and it's me reading the lore to you guys. I hope you guys like it. Um, and if you have, what do you think about Katashi? Do you like his lore? Do you think it could be better? Let me know down in the comments down below. And as always, guys, I will see you in my next video. Take care.